Um, my name is Dr. Kevin Sauter, and I'm one of the three co-directors of the conference and a professor in the Communication Studies program. Um, and I want to welcome all of you to this, the 29th annual Undergraduate Communication Research Conference. We believe, and I could be lying about this, but we think it's the oldest, longest running undergraduate uh, research conference in the country. So we're very, very pleased about that. I want to particularly welcome back the uh, faculty who have been uh, participants and supporters of our conference for so, uh, so many years. Uh, you know, we lost two years, and um, we were a little bit nervous about the resurgence, uh, whether or not we would be able to reignite the conference and, and make it uh, work again, and I think it's to a tribute to your faculty uh, supervisors here that they have encouraged you, the students to turn in your papers and uh, come to the conference. And so without the faculty supervisors and advisors, this conference would not be successful. So I'd like to give a round of applause to the supervisors that are here, the faculty members. We, of course, uh, want to celebrate the fact that we have um, over 60 student presenters at our conference. We have representation from 20 schools from around the region, and we have people coming as far away as Nebraska. We have people from South Dakota. We have Wisconsinites, uh, Minnesota people, and uh, so we're, we have people traveling to this conference from far and wide, and we are particularly pleased to welcome those of you who have come from uh, far away to our conference. So thank you for making the effort to make your way here. That's terrific. Um, I have a lot of thank yous to, uh, to people that have supported the conference and made it work. Uh, so give me just a moment to mention a few names uh, and recognize some people who have helped us along the way. Uh, the first are the group of reviewers that all of us are faculty members that, uh, that support this conference and reading papers beyond the papers that we have in our classes is not always the funnest thing to do. It's just one more paper to read. And, uh, and yet we had people step up and volunteer to read 10, 20, 30 different papers. And I think that is terrific. Uh, a number of these people are not well uh, associated, none of them are really associated with St. Thomas in their uh, full-time jobs. Uh, so they're not here, but we, I want to recognize them. First of all, uh, this is really fun. Uh, Margaret Murphy and Catherine Murphy, the Murphy sisters, if you can believe that, uh, were students here and participated in this conference, have gone on to graduate school and are pursuing their PhDs at the University of Illinois Champaign, uh, Urbana, and they were part of our reading group and they did a terrific job of uh, looking at submissions and deciding who can be accepted. Uh, then we had a group of uh, people that helped with the top paper awards. And the three people uh, are Dr. Emily Sauter, uh, Dr. Justin Rudnick, and Dr. Whitney Ghent. Um, Dr. Uh, Sauter and Dr. Rudnick are at the uh, Minnesota State University at Mankato, and Dr. Ghent is at the University of Nebraska, Omaha. And um, we do have Dr. Sauter here, so thank you. You can accept all that applause and just pass it on to the, to the others. Um, we've had, uh, I want to thank our department chair, uh, Dr. Olga Herrera, who has been very supportive of this process. And uh, so thank you, Olga. And then we have our dynamic duo, the, my co-directors, who uh, truly are the people that have made this conference work that without them, uh, it just would not fly. Uh, in fact, many of the things that you received that might have had my name on it, it came from them. Uh, so I appreciate their professionalism and their support. So let me introduce uh, Mr. Andrew Leet, who is uh, terrific. Andrew, give us a... Andy is in his first year of helping us with the conference, so he's learning the ropes, and it was just great bringing him on board. But our veteran uh, is Oyuna Aranchameg, uh, who has been with us for uh, eight years, I think, something like that. And she really runs the show in many ways. But unique this year is that Oyuna is a Paralympian. 
and she was at the Beijing Olympics and participated in um, uh, wheelchair curling, and we are just so proud of her, and we want to thank her not only for the work here, but the, the way she has represented St. Thomas, Minnesota, and the United States. So, Oyuna. And of course, we want to thank the people who are uh, kind of nameless, faceless people behind the scenes, the people who are running our AV, the people that are serving our food, the people who have set up this beautiful arrangement. So we want to thank those folks as well. And then the final group are the student presenters that I want to thank. And I recognized your uh, supervisors, but it is you that makes this thing work. Uh, I am just so proud of you for submitting your work. I know it's a little nerve-wracking. It's like there's always a little bit of imposter syndrome going on, right? Like, oh my God, is my paper good enough? And yet, uh, I can tell from having read virtually every paper, uh, they are outstanding. And I know talking to uh, Emily and her colleagues about the top paper awards, it was very, very difficult because all the papers are so wonderful, so well-researched, so well-written, and um, I can say across the board that you have done a super job. So give yourselves a round of applause. Now, as one little sidelight, we mentioned as you came in that you could sign up for our drawing. So be sure, if you haven't done so, to put your name in there. We have some nice prizes that are designed to uh, give you a reward for having been here all day. So if you can put your name in that little box out there, we'll do the drawing after the, the third session. So be sure you do that. But uh, the papers were wonderful, and we have selected a group that uh, represent the best of the work that is done here. Uh, our first round readers uh, nominated people for the top paper awards, and those people that were nominated but not constituting that that top group uh, should also be very, very proud of themselves, and they're mentioned in the program as uh, honorable mention. So those people, congratulations, you did a great job. But the top paper award is um, one that we have, uh, a tradition we have carried on for uh, since the beginning of this conference, and we are just so pleased to recognize the hard work, the excellent research, the wonderful writing that is done uh, at the undergraduate level in communication. And that's, that's really important, that this is our conference for our discipline and the work that you do. And so we have three top papers, and they have been mentioned uh, in the program, and you've seen them go along uh, on the screen. But let us recognize those people and give them their award. Uh, the first one is Zachariah Walker from Bethel University. And his paper is Tearing Apart a Dead Man in the Middle of the Woods, Romanticism and Realism in the critical response to John Krakauer's Into the Wild. Before you come up, I just want to say that I read that paper and I was so intrigued that I had to go and read the book. So that was my, uh, my travel. Uh, uh, Zachariah's faculty advisor was Yu Li Chang Zacher. So would you come on up and, uh, and receive your award? Yuli, would you like to get a picture with you and your student? Yes. <laughs> See, academic love right there, folks. <laughs> Our second uh, top paper award goes to Bella Bott, Mer uh, I'm sorry, Morgan McDonald, Ali Wahlberg, and Anya Wood from the University of St. Thomas for their paper, Inside, Inside Out, and their faculty advisor is Dr. Bernard Armada. Come on up, Bernie. Love the movie, love the paper. Those plaques will be on your walls for the rest of your life. <laughs> Bernie, are you going to get a couple of your
Very good, thank you. And our third paper, our third top paper award goes to uh, Casey Moorer uh, from McAllister College, Redefining Negligence, Applying Apologetic Image Repair Theory to Ronald Reagan's 1987 Address to the American Foundation for AIDS Research. Um, and uh, faculty advisor is Adrienne Christensen. Now, I want to take a moment to recognize Adrienne. She has been uh, just on the block at McAllister, but she's been such a good friend to our department and to this conference. I believe you've come from the beginning and been here uh, virtually every year. And not only that, but probably has more students that have won top paper awards than any other faculty member. So this is both for Casey and for Adrienne. Congratulations. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Adrian is retiring from full-time teaching, and we're going to, I think you'll still be here, though, next year, won't you? Yeah, bad. All right. Very good. Thank you all. One of the reasons we started this conference 30 years ago is that we wanted to celebrate undergraduate research. Uh, one of our uh, a former colleague of ours, Tom Endries, went to a conference up in uh, the Fargo-Moorhead area, and he came back excited about uh, starting our own research conference. And we set out to not just celebrate uh, the research that our students did, but the breadth of the field, the discipline, that we are in this room all part of the communication discipline. We are all calm students in one way or another. And I think that's so vital to bringing us together and making us feel like we are a part of something and we have something in common. Um, and I think back on the years that we have uh, run this conference, and I think we have touched on virtually every little niche in the field, if you will, uh, as we've celebrated undergraduate uh, papers. You probably saw some this morning and went, where did that come from? You know, there's so many different ways and corners that you can use communication research in order to understand the world. Um, I also want to point out the list that's on our uh, schedule and outside of our keynote speakers. If you look at that list, you will see some of the great people in our field that uh, they, sell, they, they have done research in all the areas. We have had interpersonal scholars, we have media scholars, we have had people that have worked on small group communication, um, we have had LGBTQ scholars that are here, and uh, uh, political rhetoric, and uh, just the, the entire field has been represented. And just a couple of years ago, we had uh, an environmental communication uh, speaker. So we're still continuing ex to expand just as the field has to, uh, expanded. And this year I think it's particularly interesting that we have with us uh, a sport communication expert because that's another tributary of communication that is developing and we're just so pleased to be able to integrate that into our conference. Now I grew up, I'm going to take a little side note here, I grew up in a family with six boys, no sisters. And there was a little bit of competition in my family. And uh, one of the, my memories of sport communication would occur when we would go down to our unfinished basement and we would play hockey with just sticks and a tennis ball. And I would say that sport communication took place during those games, <laughs> none of which I can mention here. But the real key was when my dad, my hardworking dad, came downstairs, descended into the pit with the rest of us, and he would play for about 10 or 15 minutes, and the energy in the room would just ramp up as everybody was excited because Dad was playing. Well, his signature move was to take his stick and whack you on the leg and yell, shinny on your own side. <laughs> 60 years later, I have no idea what that actually meant. But it has stayed in our memory as, as really, for me, one of my early uh, reminiscences about sport communication. Since then, of course, we have heard phrases that stick in our minds, things like, um, uh, do you believe in miracles, right? Uh, for those of you that are baseball fans, you might remember 
And we'll see you tomorrow night after Kirby Puckett hit a home run in Game 6 of the World Series. Got to be pretty old to remember that, though, unfortunately. Um, and, of course, I always laugh about, you always remember the Vikings because uh, their famous phrase is, the kick is up and it's wide left. Um, once again, some of you have to be older in order to, to really get that. But, um, but these are parts of uh, the, the developing field of sport communication. But it's not just that. It is an incredibly wide-ranging uh, discipline, sub-discipline that has developed really only in the last 20 years or so. And so one of the great things about having our speaker today is that he is, would you consider yourself one of the founding fathers of the field of sport communication? Okay, how, how about a, we'll, we'll call you a nanny as it goes through its adolescence. Uh, but um, this field is, uh, I, I can't believe we didn't figure this out early enough for me to study it. Uh, I would have loved it. Uh, but truly in the, in the 2000s, uh, sport communication has started as a nugget, a little bit of a trail coming up to it, and then just really exploded on the scene. And it is people like uh, Dr. Butterworth and his colleagues who have really allowed this big uh, discipline to grow and get broader and get deeper. Um, I could spend some time talking about him because his CV is about 25 pages long, but I will say this. If you've been reading the little uh, clip that came up here or st on the poster that we sent out, you know that he's a really big deal. Uh, the other day I was with one of my brothers and I told him that we had this guy coming in for this talk and he goes, well, who is he? So I, all I did is have to read what was on his signature of his email, that he's the director of the Center for Sports Communication and Media, the governor and W. Richards chair for the Texas Program in Sports and Media. He's in the Department of Communication Studies in the Moody College of Communication at the University of Texas at Austin. That is a mouthful right there. But then you start going into the work that he has done. And again, I'm not going to go through it all, or he won't get to talk. But he has developed so many different areas in the field that he has participated in, whether it be in the, um, uh, the work that he has done with baseball, with uh, communication and uh, sport and democracy, uh, LGBTQ issues. He has worked on mythology and sport. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And it's a tribute to him that this field continues to grow and we're just so thankful for his leadership in it. So with that, let me just simply introduce uh, Dr. Michael Butterworth and Trump, COVID and justice, the impact of sports communication in the wake of 2020. Michael. Well, I want to begin by thanking Dr. Souter and, and everybody else who has been uh, a part of planning this conference. Uh, I was asked uh, last evening at dinner why I wanted to accept this invitation, and I couldn't possibly think of any reason to say no. Who wouldn't want to honor the opportunity to meet with colleagues in the field? Who wouldn't want the opportunity to be able to engage with ideas of substance? And as I've been able to witness this morning in a couple of panels already, who wouldn't want to be able to see the future of how we talk about all of these issues by listening uh, to the excellent work of, of all of the students here. So I want to share uh, the comments made already and congratulate everybody on your excellent work and, and being part of this conference. And it's a real honor for me to be able to be back uh, with you all for an in-person opportunity to talk about undergraduate research. Uh, as Dr. Souter suggested, there are a lot of different ways we could talk about communication in sport, or as I'll use, I think it's a little easier off the, off the tongue to say sports communication, so I'm going to use that phrase uh, today. There are a lot of ways that we might talk about that, and I, there's no way I can cover uh, all of that. And even what I've suggested from the title here is probably uh, too much to tackle, because there's a lot embedded in talking about Trump, COVID-19, and justice if we're putting that in the context of sports. And you'll notice that the year 2020 appears in quotation marks. The idea behind that is to suggest that 2020 will rhetorically signify much more for us than just the calendar year of 2020. It will, over the course of time, even more so than we recognize now, become a, a rhetorical shorthand for an entire era and a set of implications for what, uh, what that has meant for us. But I think it's helpful for us to go back 
to the very beginning of 2020 and think about the issues that were front and center for us, beginning with the very beginning of the year and the news out of Australia about the effects of climate change and the really terrifying wildfires that were happening there. Just shortly after that, on January 16th, the first impeachment trial, the first of two impeachment trials, began against Donald Trump. And just a few days after that, on January 20th, we reported the first COVID-19 case in the United States. That is just a little over two years ago, and I'm going to guess it's a safe assumption that that feels like both yesterday and a lifetime ago at the exact same time. So that isn't that much, uh, that much time that, that has passed, but so, so much has happened. Now, none of that, at first, is specifically about sports, but sports in the United States initially responded to all of this kind of news with a shrug. We're gonna continue business as usual. The LSU Tigers completed a historic season, winning the national championship in college football. The Kansas City Chiefs beat the San Francisco 49ers in the Super Bowl. And we made it to February. On February 12th, spring training opened, and it appeared that we would have a season as usual. But it was right at about that point when things started to really change, and we began to grasp the gravity of what was happening. In March of that year, we saw a series of leagues around the world, actually, begin to make announcements that they were suspending play. That really started uh, with a tennis tournament, Indian Wells in California, and then all of the major football leagues in Europe, which suspended play between March 8th and March 11th. Also, right at that time frame, the first college conference suspended play, and that was the Ivy League on March 11th. And arguably, the decision that probably brought it home for people most vividly was when the NBA said on March 12th that we're postponing the season indefinitely. A couple of other things happened on that date which are significant, one of which is that Tom Hanks announced that he was positive for COVID-19, and I'm not sure there's a popular figure who is more universally beloved than Tom Hanks. If any of you out there don't like Tom Hanks, I challenge you to share that with the people at your table, right? Also on that day, uh, President Trump announced the first set of travel restrictions in response to the emerging pandemic. And so the gravity of what was happening, I think really we can kind of uh, timestamp that on March 12th in particular ways. Now a couple of months later, we begin to have a new conversation about unfortunately not a new issue, and that is with the resurgence of Black Lives Matter activism. Now, I know you don't need me here in the Twin Cities to tell you about the significance of George Floyd's murder and the response publicly to that, but it clearly prompted a resurgence of attention within the world of sports. And that is something that happened in concert with a series of tragic news stories, right? Learning, the deaths, uh, learning about the deaths of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, which unfortunately were echoes of a series of news stories over the past decade. A, a far too long list of names that includes Trayvon Martin and Tamir Rice, Alton Sterling, and Philando Castile, and Sandra Bland. All of these cases that had prompted a renewed interest in racial justice activism in 2016, which we most commonly associate with Colin Kaepernick taking a knee and a host of others in that conversation. And we saw that come back in May and into the summer of 2020. So those are two major issues already, the pandemic, the resurgence of Black Lives Matter activism and the struggle for racial justice. And then in the midst of all of this, we also have the 2020 presidential election. Now, partisan politics aside, it is safe to conclude that Donald Trump as both a candidate and a president didn't merely challenge, but rather upended the norms of political communication in this country and the democratic assumptions that we make about how we function politically have been under contest ever since. Now, I don't think that Trump is the only manifestation of that. He's obviously the most visible and the most significant given his uh, election to the presidency. Now, as president, in the midst of the crises that are emerging, the presidential administration downplayed, openly downplayed the significance of COVID-19 and ultimately publicly struggled with how to present what the nation should do moving forward, and that was probably most dramatically evidenced by the kind of public tensions between the president and Dr. Anthony Fauci. 
Meanwhile, President Trump, like all presidents before him, looked to sports as a political symbol that could be used in an election year. Now, believe it or not, all of this is preamble because we have to have some context. I saw uh, uh, two panels worth of papers this morning and the students all did a wonderful job of providing a historical context from which we can make some interpretations. And all of this allows us to begin to think about the significance of sports communication in 2020 and beyond. So a few assumptions and definitions uh, that will help uh, guide the rest of the presentation. First of all, I think that we're really seeing an unprecedented convergence of issues that happened in the year 2020. There's a reason that uh, historians and political observers and academics all made comparisons between 2020 and the year 1968, because it was, we needed a reference point that said, when else have things been this volatile for us to try to make sense of? And, and so that became a common point of reference. Uh, there are, there's a little question that there are global implica implications for all of the things uh, that are, are part of this discussion. I will focus primarily on the United States, however, because there are unique features in the U.S. and because, frankly, that's the expertise that, that I can offer. Uh, I am a rhetorical scholar, and so much of what I'm doing here is informed by my perspective as a rhetorician. For those of you who are not familiar with rhetoric, it is the art and practice the ancient art and practice of persuasion. We're invested in the use of symbols, in the use of language, and the way that symbols and language can induce people to see the world in a particular way. So rhetoric is uh, often viewed as a negative term in contemporary uh, conversations, and it's also often juxtaposed against action. Now, that's just rhetoric, that's not action. I think there's a much closer relationship between the two of those than we often hear, especially in popular discourse. Rhetoric shapes our attitudes, and our attitudes influence our actions, and I think we'll see that in some ways here today. This is also a reflection of what Dr. Sauter was talking about in the emergence of sports communication or communication in sport as a robust subfield in communication studies as a discipline. This is a multi-methodological, multi-interdisciplinary pursuit in many ways, and it does touch on all of the different aspects of communication that we might think about, and at the end of the presentation, I'll suggest some possible directions that we might pay attention to in different uh, related subfields. So what I want to do is try to address this enormous context of 2020 and beyond by looking at three specific sports contexts, college football, Major League Baseball, and the NBA and WNBA together. Um, I'm going to start with college football, and I want to start with one of the tendencies that we have uh, with respect to the way that we think about uh, coaching. Uh, coaches uh, contribute a great deal. There's no question about that, but I think we have an overinvestment, especially at the level of big-time college athletics, an overinvestment in the kind of moral authority that coaches can lend beyond the college sports context. Well, they're molders of men, they're leaders, and so we'll look to them to offer us insight about other things, like, for example, a pandemic. Now, that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense if we think about it in that strict relationship, but when you think about somebody like Dabo Sweeney, the head coach of the college football program at Clemson, one of the most successful programs in all of college sports right now, uh, you can see where that authority sort of gets granted. One of the things that Sweeney does in this comment that you see from April of 2020 is invoke a common mythology in the United States, that of the myth of American exceptionalism. The idea that the United States has been so chosen, perhaps by God himself, to lead the world as an experiment in democracy and hope, and that we are unique. And to the extent that we're unique, exceptionalism might fuel some very positive, affirmative attitudes within the nation. To the extent that we translate uniqueness into superiority, it can be damaging. And one of the things that happens with American exceptionalism is that we believe that we can simply will ourselves to victory because we want it badly enough and we're virtuous enough. So here's Dad Boswini talking about how we're going to get through the pandemic by invoking the fact that we're Americans. We put people on the moon. We stormed the beaches at Normandy. Normandy's gonna come up again, by the way. Uh, and this is a familiar theme, and I think, you know, certainly college football in particular, coaches love military history. They like to make the intersections between the two, and there are some parallels that make some sense. But here we see this idea that we're just gonna be tough. We're gonna rise up, 
kick this thing in the teeth and move on with our lives. So if we can just be tough enough, be rugged individuals, shout out to our Theodore Roosevelt uh, presentation from earlier, then we'll be able to get through this. Now this is something that comes up from other people as well, it's not just Dabo. Mike Gundy is the head coach of the college football team at Oklahoma State talking about how these are young guys, they're healthy. They can fight this off. Oh, and by the way, in addition to being able to fight this off, we really need them on the field because they make money for y'all. Now, this is the saying the quiet part out loud, so to speak. College sports is presented to us on the basis of amateurism, presented to us on the idea that students are student athletes, they are not workers. But here, Gundy is telling us that they're more than students, that they are engines of economic health in the state of Oklahoma. Now this again is going to come up as, a, as another theme, but the idea here is to say, well, what are the priorities that we are paying attention to? Where's the symbolic significance if we're suggesting that the athletes need to be on the field primarily because the economy depends on it, rather than addressing, at this point, this is April, folks, we're still really in the dark about how to address the pandemic. Now, uh, Gundy ends up being an interesting uh, person to focus on in, in another way, because there's another moment in a press conference for Gundy where he's talking about uh, political division in the United States and the way that news is presented to us. And he says, you know what? I found something that I think is an answer. I found a network that's just refreshing, was the word he used. There's no left, there's no right, it's just news. That network was One America News. Again, partisan politics aside, I'm here to tell you, if you are unfamiliar with One America News, it is not a news network. It is explicitly a propaganda machine. One America News has no interest in the truth. It has no interest in objective reality. And I'm not worried about whether I'm accused of being biased or partisan here. We need to be able to tell the truth about the fact that a news network isn't selling you news. So when Gundy says, hey, this is just this great opportunity to talk about issues and it's really clear and it's refreshing, that has some pretty significant implications, especially because one of the things that One America News was actively seeking to do was to discredit the Black Lives Matter movement. And why is that important in this particular context? Well, 46% of athletes in football bowl subdivision programs, those are the big ones, right? The big programs that we're most familiar with. You're gonna be championship subdivision? Yeah, so fo football championship subdivision here. Uh, congratulations, by the way, on the, on the jump to division one. So football bowl subdivision programs, 46% of those athletes are black. At Oklahoma State, it's over 50%. Mike Gundy is a middle-aged white guy talking about whether or not these predominantly black athletes should or should not be on the field while praising a network that is actively seeking to discredit a movement that many of these players are in support of. Now, that gets additional weight when Gundy shows up, or this uh, image shows up, of Gundy wearing an OAN t-shirt. The significance here is that uh, the star player for Oklahoma State, Chuba Hubbard, who is black, calls Gundy out on social media, says, I will not stand for this, to which Gundy says, oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize. I didn't know what was really happening with the network. There's a news publication called The Intercollegiate, which is now part of Sportico. Intercollegiate did a public records request, found out that Gundy had had email conversations with One America News Network weeks before this story broke, in which he said, I love what y'all do. So here we have a moment where either Mike Gundy is tremendously ignorant or tremendously disingenuous. I'll leave it to you to decide which one you think. I think it is, but uh, we, this is also indicative of a system in which certain priorities and values are being offered to us. Now to come back to this idea of willing ourselves through the pandemic, here's Lou Holtz. He won a national championship with Notre Dame, so he must be credible, right? He's talking with Laura Ingram on Fox News and says, look, there's a little bit of risk involved here. We gotta play though. I mean, everything has risk. By golly, they stormed the beaches at Normandy. They knew there was risk. It was just a way of life. To suggest that storming the beaches of Normandy, that's D-Day, by the way, just to, for historical clarification. 
to storm the beaches at Normandy in arguably the single most pivotal moment of World War II, to suggest that that was merely a way of life, I can't imagine a more cavalier and insulting way to describe the significance of what that moment meant, let alone the fact that it now treats in the same sort of cavalier way what these athletes are being asked to do. But again, we see these echoes in many other quarters. Ed Orgeron just won a national championship with LSU, and he wants to remind us that football is the lifeblood of our country. Our state, our nation need football. But it's not restricted to college coaches, I'm afraid. It's also going to come from politicians. And in particular, this is all going to lead up to a specific moment in August. Ben Sass, senator from Nebraska, writes an open letter to university presidents in the Big Ten urging them to play college football. Senator Kelly Loeffler for, uh, from the state of Georgia tweets about wanting to make sure that we listen to the voices of the players. They want to play, so we should let them play. Representative Jim Jordan from the state of Ohio, America needs college football. Just to make sure that I'm clear here, because at, at this point in the presentation, that could be interpreted otherwise very easily. I love college football. <laughs> I really do. But I'm not sure I need it. I'm not sure we need it as a nation in the way that it's being talked about, especially, remember, in the context of a pandemic and a racial justice crisis. Right? Vice President Mike Pence says the same thing. America needs college football. It's important not just for these players, but for our nation. President Trump himself, we need to play college football. Hashtag, we want to play. That hashtag emerged from a players' movement, most visibly with Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields, both of whom also suggested that perhaps in arguing to play, we might also consider a players' association. Now, that part isn't part of the conversation in this particular case, right? Play college football. And all of this is leading up to August 10th, the day before the Big Ten was going to make its decision about whether or not it would suspend the season in 2020. As you likely know, initially the Big Ten did and then later rescinded that decision and played a truncated uh, schedule. Uh, ultimately, uh, we did see uh, a full season uh, across college football. I'll get to that in just a moment. Now, all of this is happening in a particular place. This isn't arbitrary. This isn't a, a state where we know the electoral outcome is absolutely certain. It's happening primarily in places that we perceive to be swing states. Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, the states that we believe are going to turn the tide in the 2020 election. And so there's an enormous amount of focus on getting football back to the point that the president himself believes that this is a symbolic win. The very first debate in 2020, President Trump said, it was me. I brought college football back and I'm glad to have done it. Right? A recognition that he sees significant political symbolism in sports. Now, aside from the fact that Big Ten officials dispute that, they suggest that the president did not influence their decision and, in fact, did not want the politics involved in their decision. You can make your own judgment about that as well. Um, there's also no uh, evidence to suggest that any of the outcomes in those states was affected by the decision to play or not to play college football. Uh, so various surveys have, have been inconclusive in trying to figure that out. So we had a season. The FBS season was completed. Uh, we lost a lot of games along the way, including 19 bowl games. And fortunately, it does appear that we avoided any serious complications. Yes, some people did get sick. Some people missed games. Games were canceled, et cetera. To our knowledge, there were no serious complications. I do think that's one of the open questions still with COVID. We're not completely certain what long-term consequences we may be looking at. And by the way, at the end of the year, just to sort of tie a bow around all of this, after this season does happen, the president awards Lou Holtz, he of the Normandy as a way of life, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. So again, the, the symbolism and the intersection of what college football means in a political context is made clear by that decision. All right, that's college football. That's just one particular example. A second example is Major League Baseball. Now, baseball uh, on March 12th also announced that it would be suspending its season. That didn't get nearly as much attention because we were in spring training at that point. But then baseball did what baseball does. It fought with itself. Right? Baseball ownership and baseball players do not like one another. You saw that at the beginning of this season. That's why we were delayed a week, because of the collective bargaining agreement negotiations. So in April and May, baseball endures this lengthy, protracted, antagonistic 
discussion about when to come back. And by the way, safety of the players was not the primary topic of conversation. Salary was the primary topic of conversation in that negotiation. Finally, on June 23rd, MLB announced a 60-game season would be played that would open on July 23rd. It's a long, long time before they finally had that resolution, and the World Series was played in October as normal, and the Los Angeles Dodgers won. We'll come back to that in just a second. So here's this moment, and baseball retains the rhetorical label of being the national pastime, even though it is by far no longer the most popular sport in this country. But here was a moment when baseball could actually step into an open space, a moment to say we could perhaps reclaim at least a portion of being the national pastime. Nobody's playing anything right now. So what are we going to do? Are we going to play? Ah, let's fight some more, right? That was kind of what the uh, outcome ended up being. That space was filled in some interesting ways, and in, in strictly baseball terms, uh, when the Korean baseball organization came back to play, they came back several weeks before Major League Baseball did, ESPN began airing those games uh, overnight, one o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. Eventually that phased out as sp sports in the United States did make their way back. When the Major League Baseball season began on July 23rd, it was after two months of intense discussion and in the street protest with respect to racial justice. Baseball largely dodged that conversation in 2016 and 17. It would have been absolutely impossible to do so in 2020. So when they came back, uh, here's the Washington Nationals. They were the defending World Series champions, so they had the first game. Nationals players are pictured here on their knees holding a black cloth between them, which is designed to symbol unity among the players in the wake of this emerging conversation. Also, for opening day for Major League Baseball, the Nationals invited Dr. Anthony Fauci to throw out the first pitch. Now, Donald Trump had been previously invited to throw out a first pitch and had declined, and uh, then later attended a World Series game in 2019 at which he was booed by the crowd. So there's uh, some interesting backstory here. And then by July, the relationship between Trump and Fauci was very clearly tense at best. So this is a fairly clear symbol that the Washington Nationals are using in inviting him. It's not that the president was left out, however. ESPN's game day coverage of that opening day included a feature where Mariano Rivera, the legendary reliever for the New York Yankees, had a game of catch with the president on the White House lawn. And so once again, recognizing the symbolic trappings of baseball and its historic association with national identity, here is the president using baseball uh, in, in this moment. So three different ways that the rhetorical significance of sports is on display for us in just this one particular moment. Now, with respect to baseball, the 2020 World Series ends up providing a particularly interesting example of all of the things we're trying to sort through because the Dodgers and Rays played a neutral field World Series, which is not the norm, where the Dodgers did win. But I would say the most memorable moment of this is that after the Dodgers won, Here's the uh, picture of uh, at least some of them celebrating. Uh, in the foreground is Justin Turner with the, the red beard. Late in the game, just, Justin Turner disappeared from the game. Wasn't on the field, wasn't in the lineup. Announcers didn't know where he was. And eventually we found out that the reason he left the game is because a COVID-19 test had come back positive for him. News was received of that during the game and Major League Baseball protocol demanded that he be removed which should have meant that he not come back on the field. And that here's a Justin Turner, smiling Justin Turner on the field, no mask, celebrating with his teammates. So for all of us who are thinking, what's the right decision to make? Do I wear a mask? Do I support wearing masks? Should we close stores? Should we just keep them open? What are the rules going to be? How do we keep people safe? Who's invested in keeping us safe? All of that condensed into a single moment here in Major League Baseball when a player who has just received a positive test comes back onto the field without adhering to any of those protocols. Major League Baseball did investigate the Dodgers and Justin Turner and ultimately decided to punish them by doing nothing. So that leaves us in a fairly ambiguous position as viewers, as consumers. All right, that's baseball. What about the NBA and the WNBA as a third possible context here? 
Well, this is a particularly interesting one because the conversation about racial justice in these two leagues predates 2016 significantly. The image here is a picture of the Miami Heat and uh, the players wearing hoodies in tribute to Trayvon Martin, who had been killed earlier that year. And that's obviously four years before uh, the Take a Knee protests began. And we shouldn't be surprised by this in some respects. After all, 73% of the National Basketball Association is black. That's even a higher percentage in the WNBA. But what also distinguishes these leagues, and especially the NBA, is that unlike, say, the NFL, where Colin Kaepernick, when he began his protest, was a third-string quarterback, in the NBA, it is the most visible, prominent, best players who are also often the most outspoken. The equivalent to LeBron, LeBron James in the NFL has to be, I guess, Tom Brady in terms of visibility and success. I can assure you Tom Brady wasn't engaged in this conversation, right? So it's significant that people like LeBron James are engaged in this conversation. And so on Instagram, right after the murder of George Floyd, here's LeBron James saying, this is why we were saying what we were saying in 2016 and beyond. Uh, and of course, this is a juxtaposition of two different people, so to speak, taking a knee. So Officer Derek Chauvin and Colin Kaepernick. And I have uh, modified the image to keep us from reliving that trauma. Now, the NBA, meanwhile, is also a particularly interesting site for this because while the NBA has far more visibility, the WNBA has a much longer and clearer track record of being an advocate for social justice causes. So it was actually the Minnesota Lynx right here in 2016 in July that first introduced the language of Black Lives Matter in that particular conversation. This is a month before Colin Kaepernick began his protest. And in this particular case, you see the Lynx players wearing t-shirts that say, change starts with us. On the back are the names of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile with Black Lives Matter beneath it. This predates Chris Paul and Carmelo Anthony, LeBron James and Dwayne Wade at the ESPYs. This predates the Take a Knee protests in the NFL. This predates a lot of the conversation from LeBron. The WNBA has been deeply invested in community issues. Uh, oops, I forgot that I didn't comment on that last part. Deeply invested in uh, community issues uh, in significant ways. And I'm not suggesting WNBA players are smarter necessarily. I do not equate having a degree with intelligence. I do not equate having an education with being ethically or morally superior. But it is the case that WNBA players are more educated than NBA players, including, in many cases, master's degrees. And I think that does suggest that they're having conversations at earlier stages and in different ways that they can translate to the community. And then, across the board, WNBA players have tended to have closer alignment and identification with the community uh, in general. It was the WNBA that suggested within the bubble that we have Black Lives Matter painted on the court or wear a jersey that says, say her name, on the back in honor of Breonna Taylor. And a lot of those initiatives have been carried forth in sports elsewhere. And basketball in the bubble in Orlando was an interesting experience. In some ways, it showed us that we could engage in competition and do so relatively safely. Yes, there were some issues, but for the most part, the seasons were able to proceed. And because of the insularity, right, these two leagues are, are they're, well, they're, each of them are together as leagues, right, they're sequestered. There's an intensity of that community that results from that and an intensity of attention that can be given to some of these issues, which happens to overlap then with yet another instance of violence, in this case, Jacob Blake being shot repeatedly in the back in Kenosha, Wisconsin. So Kenosha's default home team is the Milwaukee Bucks, the Bucks say, you know what, we're not going to play. And this is a playoff game. Now, there's something really interesting about this. Uh, by the way, I'm not going to use the word boycott here. This is a strike, not a boycott. Right? A boycott is, is an outside member choosing not to purchase or participate. This is the Bucks themselves saying, we're not going to play. Now, ultimately, uh, after this happened, they met with President Barack Obama and had some discussions about saying, all right, we've made a point. Now we want to come back to the court, but I think what really is uh, important here is that this res reminds us of the importance of collective action over individual action. 
Yeah, so your third string quarterback took a knee. Fine, that's one guy. Your entire team isn't gonna play. Oh, well, what, how are we gonna handle that, right? It's an entirely different response. And if you think about some of the issues that matter most to athletes, if they collectively were able to respond, we might see some very different kinds of, uh, of results from that. And I think a really good example of how those collective responses can make material impact is with the Atlanta Dream. So Senator Kelly Loeffler, who we mentioned earlier, it was a co-owner of the Atlanta Dream. And Loeffler's re-election campaign emphasized, among other things, uh, an antagonism toward the Black Lives Matter movement. Again, alienating the players for whom you know, she was a co-owner. Those players said, well, we don't really want you to win the Senate race then because we don't feel that you have our interests at heart. So they began to wear Vote Warnock t-shirts to support her opponent, the Reverend Raphael Warnock. Other players in the WNBA began to wear Vote Warnock shirts as a result as well. When that election began, Raphael Warnock had virtually no name recognition in the state of Georgia, let alone this country. And today he's a US senator. Now is it because of the WNBA Atlanta Dream and only because of them? No. Do they have something to say about this narrative? Absolutely. And Warnock himself acknowledges that it was one of the many turning points in the campaign. So if we talk about the power of sports to communicate, to be a platform, and for collective action, this is an ideal situation to be able to see that. All right, I think with these three contexts, then, there are a number of conclusions we can draw. And I'm going to draw some conclusions about 2020 and beyond in a moment, but I also want to comment specifically on the field of communication studies and some of its sub-areas. Media studies has been out in front on this for years. They were the first ones to figure out that it made sense to study sports, and that makes sense because sports are so heavily mediated. But I think there's no question the pandemic has changed sports media. It's changed the way we broadcast. It's changed the way that we interpret uh, what the role of the media is. In particular, I think it has probably spelled the final statement or you know, gave us the final statement on whether or not it's possible to stick to sports. Right. For so long, we've heard, oh, media just wants to report about the games. They just want to talk about the games and the athletes. That's impossible. Because as I think we have seen in so many ways, there are just too many intersections between economics and politics and culture. So how we do that is a matter of open discussion. But that we do that, I think, is now something that we have to accept. From a position of rhetorical studies, again, my area you know, where we tend to focus a great deal on politics and public affairs, we have some very clear overlaps here, moments where sport clearly helps to create a community, moments where sport can obviously influence politics and policy. For those of us who are interested in organizational communication, what are the values that we are communicating when we suggest that we want to prioritize competition or prioritize coverage over public health? for example. How do we as organizations respond to crisis? We had at least two significant crises that emerged during 2020 that all sports organizations were forced uh, and faced with. Uh, interpersonal communication, we've got any number of individual decisions that might affect collective outcomes. Earlier this week after the Brooklyn Nets were eliminated from the uh, NBA playoffs, Kyrie Irving in a press conference said, well, you know, we just we never got a chance to really play together very much. We didn't really gel as a team, and I'm, I'm not sure what happened there. We just didn't get that much time together. I wonder how that happened, Kyrie, right? So if you don't follow the NBA, Kyrie couldn't play for much of the year because he refused to get vaccinated. So these decisions have significant implications both for individuals and for collectives, for teams. International and intercultural communication, my goodness, we could do an entirely separate discussion about this if we think about the Olympic and Paralympic Games. If we think about, if, I, if Kyrie Irving is a good example, so is Novak Djokovic. That was a, a major storyline at the beginning of 2022. And mega events are incredibly political and significant from a standpoint of communication. I assure you there are no two organizations more corrupt than the IOC and, the, uh, and FIFA. Now, there are wonderful things that happen in these mega events, wonderful things that happen. The organizations themselves raise a lot of questions. And health communication, I think, is an obvious subfield that we should be paying attention to here as well, given the effects of the pandemic, what we do know, what we don't know, the fact that we ask athletes to take on greater risk than we ask of others, and that we make assumptions about what those risks should and could be, 
and that the convergence of everything that has happened in the last two years has shed new light on the way that we talk about mental health. All sorts of things that are possibilities here for us to set the agenda for communication studies. So some final conclusions then about 2020 and beyond. I think it's safe to say that we prioritized economics over public health. And that's not restricted to sports. I think sports are a part of this, but we did this in a number of ways. I think collectively as a culture, we made the decision that the economy was more important. I think we've seen that racial politics are too easily absorbed into organizational interests. The best example of this is the NFL. Nope, Colin Kaepernick, you don't get to have a job. Three years later, sorry, our bad. We really should have listened more. We're not gonna use Colin Kaepernick's name when we apologize, but really, we're gonna fix this. So can somebody spray end racism in the end zone and, and we're good, right? We talked about performative activism in one of the panels uh, earlier. The NFL putting end racism is nice, but maybe just don't do the racism part and then we don't need the slogan, right? And we just had a hiring, a firing and hiring cycle in the NFL offseason that lays bare the fact that this is not a resolved issue. We have any number of issues with labor and gender inequity, and, and this is something that, again, could occupy an entire conversation. I think the balance of this is changing in certain ways. Name, image, and likeness legislation changes how we think about labor in college sports. Uh, we certainly have you know, the, the ruling that the U.S. women's national team uh, in soccer will receive equal pay. I get the privilege of responding to some papers in a little bit that will talk about that. But I think the big picture is that the United States missed a really important opportunity here. As I mentioned earlier, I love college football. I love sports, really, really love sports. But I think we take them way too seriously in this country. And we had an opportunity here to say, we can figure out a way to make sports vital and important to us in our local communities, for our kids, for ourselves, for our media, and also put that into some perspective. And I think we missed an opportunity to do that. And there are a couple of ways that I, I think we can point to that. One of which is that we continue to invest authority and credibility in people who have not earned it. Again, I realize that this could, I could be accused of being biased here. Tommy Tuberville is a US senator because he was a football coach at Auburn University. He has demonstrated no capacity to understand the US Constitution or how governance works. And the only person on this slide who might be less capable of understanding the US Constitution and how governance works is Herschel Walker, who is running to be a senator in the state of Georgia. His main accomplishment is that he's a great football player. We have put so much of our investment in these figures of authority that we perhaps have missed some opportunities to question whether or not those are the authority figures that we need. Meanwhile, we continue to invest an enormous amount of resources, time, and energy in the sports complex themselves. This is a rendering of the $1.4 billion stadium that we will be built in Buffalo, $850 million of which will come from public money. Does not matter where you live in the state of New York, does not matter if you like the Buffalo Bills, does not matter if you set foot in that stadium for one of eight or nine games they play in an entire year. You will help to pay for that. By the way, your $1.1 billion U.S. Bank Stadium was financed in a similar fashion. $550 million of which came from the Vikings. $550 million came from a shared pot between the city of Minneapolis and the state of Minnesota. An NFL stadium doesn't get used all that much. It does look great, though. It's a really nice facility. And again, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't have nice facilities. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't invest in the sports infrastructure. But when we're talking about a city like Buffalo, a statement about post-industrial America that could invest that money in bridges, roads, schools, hospitals, any number of things, right? So some final conclusions. I think 2020 has to be understood in tragic terms. I don't think there's anything too insightful there. We've lived it, right? We've seen what has happened. We know that this is a tragedy in many ways. Out of tragedy can come great things, of course, and that's up to us to try to make that happen. I think it's very clear that sport is a communicative phenomenon. It reflects, it manages, and it challenges our norms, challenges our culture and politics. And I think it's very clear that there are links between sports and democracy. And although I worry that right now we have veered too far away from democratic norms, I also remain optimistic that sports can be part of the solution to bringing us back to those norms. So again, thank you so much for your time and the opportunity to be here. I appreciate it, everybody.
we have some time for questions, and we invite you to just raise your hand. I'll scoot over there and uh, provide you with a microphone. Don't be shy. Yes, sir. Um, I'm curious that you're congratulating St. Thomas for becoming a Division I school. It's probably going to cost this university millions of dollars to get into that economic engine where they'll never make any money off of sports. So there are a number of programs that have uh, probably chased what they believe to be an ideal outcome, right? We talk about a program like George Mason making the final four and all of a sudden applications and enrollments explode. It's called the Flutie factor in the 1980s after the quarterback Doug Flutie. University of Alabama has remade its entire campus based on football. Those are the exceptions and not the rule, and so I do worry any time a program says we're going to make the jump um, because you cannot replicate the conditions of the University of Alabama, whether it's St. Thomas or whether it's any number of other places. I also can't presume to know what the individual economic conditions are in any given uh, organization, any given university or athletics program. So I don't think it's impossible, and I think there are programs that have made jumps, whether it's from D3 to 2 or all the way to D1 or gone from football championship subdivision to football bowl subdivision. Um, and I don't know the particulars of how things have happened with the administration here and, and athletics. So I understand your concern about that. I would be apt, you can tell I'm wired to be critical of these things, again, even as, as I'm a fan. I'm part of a university that has arguably the single most recognized NCAA logo in all of college athletics, is the most profitable athletic program in all of college athletics, can really wield an excess amount of influence as a result of that. I'm not always comfortable with that, but I don't think that necessarily means that we, there isn't a pathway for making that happen. So uh, I'd hate to try to speculate about what the uh, economic future looks like without being able to really know that landscape. Others? Um, first of all, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. That was fascinating. Uh, and I would want to talk, uh, ask a question about your specific example. I thought including the WNBA was a really interesting choice because uh, obviously there's a lot of really important gender differences that are happening between the NBA, the WNBA, um, and all, you know the MLB and the NHL. Um, I wonder if you could talk more about why specifically you think that they are a good representative because they are doing some really different things. They have really different audiences, resources, and yet still speaking so loudly. So I think the, the WNBA is, is a particularly powerful model, um, but I'm not sure if it's replicable in all sports. The money and the visibility of the NBA, by contrast, for example, probably whether it demands it or just compels players to be more cautious, right? I think there are, yeah, so there's a, with respect to activism in athletes, there's a kind of standard narrative that says in the 1960s and 1970s, athletes rose up and they were activists. And then in the 1980s and 1990s, they got rich and they shut up. And then we've seen a resurgence of that. There is some truth to that narrative. Um, I think it's, it overreads things. But um, the, the real significance here is that we're talking about uh, LeBron can say whatever LeBron wants. He'll get criticized. I mean, the, uh, the China storyline, for example, the, and uh, the Daryl Morey tweet, tweet in China, he got a lot of criticism for that, but he's never going to end up being damaged as a brand as a result of that. But other players in the NBA might be. You know, Kyrie has been damaged as a brand because of the vaccine uh, uh, situation. So the stakes are different for WNBA players. The salaries are just dramatically different. And so I think they feel compelled and obligated, in a way, to, to speak. Uh, I think they understand being marginalized, in a way, that compels them to speak. Right? If it's, it's so common, I mean, just a typical social media sort of uh, reaction to the WNBA, where you've got guys who are jumping onto a, a comment thread to say, yeah, well, who cares? It's just the WNBA. Well, why are you posting if you don't care, right? But we go out of our way to talk about how these are insignificant leagues by contrast. And so I think there is a, I don't want to call it a chip on their shoulder, but I think there, there's a recognition that uh, they can identify with what people are experiencing 
more closely. And that's why the, and the, the racial justice activism in the NBA was as powerful as it was as well, is that that was a chance for players to say, no, I've lived this. This, this is my world, right? Um, and so I just, I think there's more of that among the WNBA. And there's more, frankly, there's more courage among the athletes in that league than there is in other leagues. We didn't even talk about Maya Moore and, you know, yeah. So you were talking earlier about um, football coaches and players being like leaders and that qualifying them to run for office positions. Why do you think people can't separate like being a coach from being qualified to run for a Senate position? Because that's obviously two different knowledge bases. Right. Well, I mean, on the one hand, we like winners. Right? So it, it, you know, losing coaches typically don't get the same sort of adulation. Tommy Tuberville wasn't a super, super successful coach, but he beat Alabama a lot. That's good enough in, uh, if you're coaching at Auburn. Um, but we have an entire rhetorical foundation for this. I, go to Amazon or just use a library search engine and find the number of books that have been written by college basketball and football coaches that are going to tell you how to win at the game of life. Right? We've internalized this metaphor that, 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 that life is a game and that there are rules by which we can take advantage. We can win, and these, are, these guys are winners. So they're leaders, they've had success, and we're going to translate that. And we do this, I think, in business as well with, you know, Elon Musk has one great idea, becomes incredibly wealthy, and now he's going to be able to figure out everything, right? We give a lot of authority to sort of that one great accomplishment. And because football expresses so many values that we respect, and because these guys win, well, maybe we should listen to them. Right? Coach K is the moral authority on everything in college athletics because he's Coach K. I'm not so sure that he's really the moral authority that we, we think he is. So we are going along um, as you were answering her question right there. Um, dang, that was just fleeing my mind for the moment. <laughs> um, but essentially, um, would you say, like, um, especially within the last 20-ish years and before that, with the blow of the internet and information being just at the clip of a button, would you think people are more willing to say, like, oh, that person's not experienced, they can look it up and get experience online sort of thing versus actually taking the time it needs to be like real verse, well known. And would you say that'd be like another reason as to why people are more willing to jump like, oh, this coach would be a center, he'll look up what to do on the job sort of thing. Or like this person wants to do it because you can find it all online. Would you say that would have some sort of effect on it for better or for worse in that sort of area? I'm really sorry, I missed a, a little bit of, of that question. Could you just rephrase it for me please? Yeah. So would you say because the internet is very prominent and we have such an easy access to information and such, that it's changed the way people view you being view people as being experts in the field because yeah. of the fact that you can just look it up on the internet and you don't have to be an expert to actually yeah. know what you're talking about anymore. A hundred percent. I did my own research. No, you didn't. You looked up a topic and you found something that spoke to you and that you liked, but you didn't do your own research, right? Look, you're talking to people who do research for a living. We get a little, uh, you know, we take that pretty personally when people start walking around, oh, I did my own research, you know. Um, and I'm not trying to, the, the internet is a, a wealth, uh, there's a wealth of information that's available there, but there's little question that yes, we have, um, that has happened in, in, in both directions. We believe ourselves to be more capable of making judgments based on the information we find, and so much of that information is skewed and is disinformation, and at the same time, we have discredited people with legitimate expertise. If you look at what we have done to people with legitimate expertise on a whole host of topics, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's climate change, whether it's, who knows, right? We have collectively diminished their expertise. Those things have happened at the same time. It's not a great combination. No. I think we have room for time for one more. There we are. So as a coach and a student going to law school, I think any sort of coach trying to just jump and leap is appalling and makes me want to throw up. 
But do you think there's anything to the regionality of those coaches who are making that jump, especially into politics, considering those tend to be big schools that rely on the southern area? <laughs> yeah, there, there's an interesting uh, geographic uh, connection there. So that's a good opportunity for me to say I, I don't want to make a judgment that should be seen as universal. Are there coaches who are great leaders? Yes. Is there great value in being part of a team, whether you're a kid or a college student or retired? Yes, right? Sports have wonderful abilities to do these things and they can cultivate some skill sets that translate very well in business or politics. But that idea that simply having been a coach allows one to speak with a kind of clarity and authority. That is insufficient for me, right? Um, I encourage you to look up Tommy Tuberville's ads, for example. He's got a, an ad where he says, you know, he's basically inviting citizens of Alabama to think of him as their coach. Right? Rhetorically, it's really effective, but um, pragmatically and politically, maybe less so. So I do think that there can be originality, creativity. I think there's applicability of those skills. I am not dismissive of sport and its values. I want to see us reconcile the balance of those values in some healthier, more democratic ways. That's great. Oh, one more, okay. Since it's you, Dr. Armada. <laughs> Thank you. It's more of a comment than anything else, but. Maybe it's a question. Isn't it because we also, as Americans, enable and give them that voice in the first place? I mean, we, we want to hear from, from successful athletes. We want them. They, we adopt them as our leaders. You know, it's not like we look at the conductor of the Minnesota Orchestra and say, man, I hope she runs for office because, you know, she conducted the Minnesota Orchestra for 20 right. years. That's just not even in the conversation. It continually goes back to, to sports, and it, it's because it bleeds into so much of our civilian lives. And it's, it's a reminder of, of that need to recalibrate. Right? Again, sports are, are meaningful. They're important. They're great. They're fun. They're dramatic. They're unexpected. Um, and they can promote healthy relationships, but they can also do a lot of things that are opposite of those, uh, those values. And... Uh, we do well to, to put sports in the context of other forms of culture or other forms of engaging with one another uh, as communities. So uh, it's not all or nothing, but right, we've overinvested in heroic figures in sports and in heroic narratives in sports. Well, thank you so much for making your way up from thank Texas. You. Thank you, Dr. Byerworth. We have just a couple of minutes for you to uh, uh, get yourself set for the final session. There are a couple extra desserts back there if you want something. Uh, remember, put your name in the drawing and stick around at the, after the third session for the drawing. Thank you all very much. <laughs>